Hi there, I'm Niall Bowie coming to you for Global Research TV on this Sunday, June 17th, 2012. The world is fast approaching a dangerous crossroads. As the beginnings of a multipolar world emerge, shifts in international opinion have become increasingly more divided over issues of grave importance. As China continues to assert itself on the world stage, recent shifts in American foreign policy indicate a refocused emphasis on the Asia-Pacific region. For more on these and other issues, I've spoken to Dr. Chandra Muzavar, a Malaysian scholar and the president for the International Movement for a Just World. Okay, thank you for being with me, Dr. Muzavar. Uh, the U.S. has recently announced its plans to move 60% of its uh, Navy to the Asia-Pacific region by 2020. Uh, Australia has agreed to a permanent U.S. military presence in Darwin, and uh, Washington is eyeing similar agreements with countries in the region. Uh, what has motivated America's shift to the <clears throat> Pacific, in your opinion? To put it in a nutshell, two factors appear to be the motivation behind the U.S. shift to the Asia-Pacific region. One is the rise of China and the desire of the U.S. as uh, an imperial power to contain and encircle China. And the second reason is because uh, the Asia-Pacific, specifically the East Asian arc in the Asia-Pacific region, is um, destined to be the center of global economic activity and the U.S. wants to benefit from this. If possible, it wants to control the process. While the United States begins its buildup in the Pacific region, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi is very close to office in Myanmar, uh, Thaksin Shinawat as well as uh, attempting to return to Thailand, and elections are around the corner here in Malaysia. Uh, how important is it for the U.S. to have uh, compliant heads of state in the region as it undertakes this, this new policy? Compliant um, heads of government, heads of state, would be very critical for U.S. hegemony. If you look at the whole pattern of U.S. hegemony, they've depended to a great extent upon uh, leaders who are prepared to do their bidding, which means that um, in the Asia-Pacific region, given the goals which the U.S. has set uh, itself, basically containing China and uh, controlling the economic development of the region, they would want to have more leaders who are prepared to play the game according to their rules, which means that they would want leaders who would help the U.S to stand up to China. They would want leaders who would make it much easier for the U.S. to control the economic and political development of the region. And they'll do it in different ways. Since some of the countries in this region are already electoral democracies, one of the avenues they would use is elections making sure that the outcomes in countries which are about to have elections would favor them. Individuals who are very closely aligned to them, they would want to see them win, for instance. And uh, I would see that as uh, one of the reasons why they're very concerned about the Malaysian elections, the imminent Malaysian elections. They would like to see a leadership which uh, would play footsie with uh, the U.S. And uh, they have a leader who would be prepared to do this, and this is Anwar Ibrahim, who has been very close to U.S. Uh, new con interests for quite a long while. He is also someone who has uh, been associated with uh, leading Zionists in the United States, like Paul Wolfowitz. So uh, the U.S. would be happy to see him in power. And what they will do is to try to sort of um, create a situation that will perhaps make it easier for him to win. Mm. Uh, critics of U.S. civil society groups, such as the National Endowment for Democracy, yeah. Freedom House, uh, have accused the organizations of fomenting a soft regime, regime change through, through democracy promotion. 
Uh, unrest has recently swept Malaysia in the form of Bursay, demonstrations calling for free and fair elections, and the group's leader, uh, Ambiga Srivasan, has uh, admitted to receiving from funds from the National Democratic Institute and George Soros Open Society Institute, which uh, both received <laughs> di direct funding from the U.S. government. Uh, what's the significance of that, in your opinion? Funding NGOs which are aligned to larger U.S. geopolitical and geoeconomic aims is something that has happened for a very long while. We know that this was one of the preferred routes which um, the hegemon took in the old uh, days during the height of Cold War politics. They funded a lot of uh, groups and they used civil society actors. They're doing it again. In fact, I had um, brought this to the notice of the Malaysian public that there was this sort of funding when it happened and that one should be concerned about this. You can't really do very much. Uh, you can't stop this sort of funding because you would be accused of um, stopping civil society organizations from functioning. Um, they need funds and you know they have every right to obtain funds from various sources and so on. So it's a very difficult situation that uh, the government finds itself in and this is also true of those of us who are very concerned about uh, global imperialism. We can't really stop funds from flowing in but at the same time uh, we know what the ultimate goal is so all we can do is to warn the public and uh, I think there is a fairly significant segment of Malaysian society that is uh, aware of this and uh, they are very concerned that this is happening if you read the uh, national language press in particular a lot of sentiments have been expressed about uh, foreign funding of this sort and uh, the goals which are being pursued. And I suspect that if um, more groups came out, especially groups that are linked to the middle class in Malaysia, and by this I mean not just uh, the Malay middle class but also the non-Malay middle class, if more people came out then I think there is a chance that uh, this would be one of the concerns of the voter when uh, he or she goes to the polls uh, in the next few months. So what would the ramifications of an opposition win be following the next Malaysian, uh, elections in Malaysia? <clears throat> if you look at um, electoral realities in Malaysia, it is um, unlikely that the opposition will win based upon past performances, based upon um, the reforms which uh, the present Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Najib Razak, has introduced, based upon, I think, uh, the weaknesses within the opposition itself, it doesn't seem likely that they would win. But on the other hand, you never know. As far as elections go, things can happen. And let us assume that um, the opposition coalition wins. What would be the implications of this? If they win and uh, Anwar Ibrahim heads the coalition uh, in power, knowing him, he would, with tremendous subtlety, reshape Malaysia's foreign policy. He has the skills to do this. And at the same time, he'll ensure that uh, the public remains with him. He will not do things which uh, will shock the nation immediately. For instance, he's not going to recognize Israel. But he will do things which will make it much easier for the U.S. to play a dominant role. It could be vis-à-vis -vis the Straits of Malacca, for instance. Now, you know, as far as the Straits of Malacca is concerned, it's a very, very important strait. It's uh, one of the three major waterways in the world. And uh, there are people who have argued that if you control the Straits of Malacca, you exercise indirect control over China's development. And it makes sense because if you look at uh, what had happened in the case of Europe after the Second World War, Europe became very dependent upon oil. Before that, it was coal. And uh, 
one of the reasons why Europe's um, energy priorities changed was because uh, the US had pushed Europe in that uh, direction and as a result made Europe very dependent upon supply of oil from the Middle East and especially from American stooges in the Middle East like the United, like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, a number of the other Gulf Emirates and so on. Now by developing that sort of dependence Europe became more dependent upon the US apart from of course the role that the Marshall Plan played and of course uh, NATO. These were the instruments used by the United States to make Europe dependent upon the United States of America. So if you can control the Straits of Malacca and uh, the South China Seas you may make China dependent upon the US and uh, the United States wants to control the Straits of Malacca. We know that this has been part of their drive in the last um, 15 years or so. But uh, if you look at the littoral states, the states which border the Straits of Malacca, there are three of them. Now, two of them, Malaysia and Indonesia, have uh, taken a position on the Straits of Malacca. They made it very clear that uh, the Straits is the responsibility of uh, the littoral states and they are the ones who would decide, not uh, some other external power. Singapore is clearly on the side of the United States of America as far as the Straits of Malacca is concerned. And even in the case of Indonesia, it was largely because uh, in the 90s when this issue first uh, emerged, the then Prime Minister in Malaysia, um, Dr. Mahdi Muhammad, he was very firm about Malaysia exercising sovereign rights over the Straits of Malacca and Indonesia went along. But if you have a weak Prime Minister in Malaysia or a Prime Minister who is pliant, who is prepared to play the role that the US wants the Prime Minister to play, then I think the policy towards the Straits will change. They would become more subservient to US interests and that would uh, undermine the Chinese in a position, which is what uh, I think the US is working towards. Now this is just one example. There are many other things they can do. I mean, look at what's happening in the Philippines. I think the Philippines uh, and its relationship with the United States of America shows very clearly that the US wants to strengthen its military presence in the ASEAN region and they will use various conflicts. Don't forget that Malaysia has also got um, a problem of sorts that uh, will have to be sorted out with China vis-a-vis -vis South China Seas, the Spratly Islands, Brunei, Vietnam. They all have uh, difficulties with China on this issue and the United States will exploit this which is why I've argued that uh, ASEAN as a whole should resolve this problem quickly with China so that you don't give an opening to the United States of America. If you look at what the US has done in various parts of the world, whenever there are difficulties amongst neighbors, the US moves in to exploit the situation for its own interests and we should try to prevent that. Uh, Myanmar's increasing openness and its willingness to work with the U.S. has enormous regional implications. Uh, it's been referred to many uh, as the, in the West as the last investment hub in Asia. Uh, how important is Myanmar in America's specific century? If you see Myanmar in relation to all the other forces and factors at work in uh, Southeast Asia, Myanmar is important. If you see it in relation to Southeast Asia's ties with China, if you see it in relation to the very critical waterways in this region and resources. It's true that Myanmar is very rich. A lot of its uh, natural wealth has not been exploited by all these predator states. And uh, there are countries which have um, strengthened their relations with uh, Myanmar in the last uh, few months. Uh, and this would include uh, even some of its neighbors like India, which has elevated its ties with Myanmar. Again, it's uh, because of resources, it's played a very big role. China is also there, building a lot of dams, infrastructure, and so on. Again, resources is one of the factors because China wants access to uh, the oil, the gas, um, other rich minerals which Myanmar has. So the resource factor is an important factor, there's no doubt about it. But I think Myanmar is also important to the U.S. for yet another reason. It's linked to Myanmar's two big neighbors, China and India. 
the U.S. would want um, India to have a bigger say over Myanmar than China as a way of curbing China's influence in this region. This goes back to the U.S.'s strategy of encircling and containing China. They're using India to some extent for this purpose, just as they're using Japan and South Korea as far as uh, the Pacific Ocean borders of uh, China are concerned. So you see this as part of something very big. As far as the land border is concerned, they're building up India in order to contain Myanmar. So there are strategic concerns which are critical to the United States of America. But the question that arises is, would they be able to do this uh, through Aung San Suu Kyi, since they've given her a lot of support? Uh, I'm personally very doubtful if they would succeed. Why? Because I think Aung San Suu Kyi has also got a very independent streak. Don't forget that uh, she is the daughter of uh, General Aung San, who was known for his independence. And if you look at some of her speeches and her writings, and just had actually produced a monograph on Aung San Suu Kyi many, many years ago, you would realize that uh, she values her independence. And she's not uh, a person who is easily taken up with neoliberal capitalism either, partly because I think she has some attachment to Buddhist ethics and this notion of uh, egalitarianism, justice, uh, restraint to the use of resources, which are all principles that uh, don't uh, dovetail with neoliberal capitalism. So I don't know whether the U.S. is uh, backing the right horse as far as Myanmar is concerned. Maybe yet uh, another of their many blunders in international relations. They back someone and the person turns out to be something else. If it can happen with someone like Hamid Karzai, who was in some ways a perfect stooge, but now Hamid Karzai is also saying, look, I want to be independent. So I think this idea of trying to look for stooges and lackeys uh, doesn't work in the end. And the US, I think, should learn a lesson from all the mistakes that they've made in the past. Okay, so uh, India is a nation of huge uh, strategic importance uh, to the United States. New Delhi has agreed to increase its trade relationship with Tehran uh, in the face, of, the face of Western sanctions. And as a member of the BRICS, India has contemplated giving loans to member nations using the rupee. Uh, is New Delhi beginning to distance itself from the US? I wouldn't uh, draw firm conclusions uh, as far as India is concerned at this point. There are, I think, uh, two dimensions which appear contradictory as far as uh, India's relations with uh, the United States goes. Number one, India has become very close to the United States of America over the last uh, 10 or 15 years and it has become more and more pronounced and it's partly because of its growing ties with Israel. In a sense, uh, India as the country which is, I think, uh, the second biggest uh, importer of Israeli arms. And this uh, has had an impact. There are a lot of Israeli tourists in uh, India. They go to all the exotic places and all the rest of it. And some of them get into all sorts of uh, tiffs with the local population. This has been happening. So this is one aspect of it. At the same time, you know, India has been given some sort of uh, nuclear protection by the United States of America, you know, a country that has not signed uh, the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and yet it has allowed uh, certain uh, dispensations as far as uh, the use of civilian fuel is concerned. So there are, I think, all these factors which have shaped India's position. And if you look at the Indian media, the uh, always gloat over their close relations with uh, the United States of America. Hillary Clinton's recent visit to Calcutta and Delhi, for instance, the way the media had uh, sort of seen that as um, an indication that uh, India is a very big power and, you know, the U.S. is going to help India achieve this. You remember the statement that Condoleezza Rice made when she was Secretary of State, we'll help you to become a world power. So I think um, Indians, at least some segments of the Indian elite and the Indian populace, they are impressed by gestures of this sort. But at the same time, don't forget that India has also got a left tradition. And uh, a left tradition which values uh, the role that India played as a leader of the non-aligned movement, 
a left tradition which is uh, very concerned about uh, social justice and egalitarianism and wouldn't want India to become yet another hub for neoliberal capitalism, which is why there's been resistance to Walmart entering the retail trade market in India and all the rest of it, which is why I think uh, they're very cautious about uh, the multinationals from uh, the US and other Western countries penetrating the Indian market. So there is that other dimension, which is why I say that you know, in India it is very paradoxical, the situation. You've got one trend which is moving in one direction, another trend which is still there and it's quite strong. And uh, India generally, if you look at its elites, uh, they're also very conscious of the fact that it's a big country and it's a country which has uh, both the present and potential influence and impact on world affairs and they don't want to be just a sort of underling of uh, the United States of any other power for that reason. So these are the factors that work against uh, total US dominance. It's not, it's not going to be that easy. The Tehran uh, oil sale issue, the issue involving sanctions, I think was an indication of that. India needs oil from uh, Tehran. It's one of its major oil suppliers. So India put its foot down as far as uh, that is concerned. And India is a member of BRICS and uh, they have made a couple of uh, statements that show that India is conscious of uh, BRICS as a new center of uh, power, both global economic power and global political power. These are hopeful signs, but at the same time, as I said, you know, uh, India has also got this other tendency. If you look at um, some of the right-wing elements and you know certain aspects of Indian uh, social behavior, China and Russia have both exercised their influence in the UN Security Council by vetoing resolutions on Syria. Uh, with the growing role of the BRICS nations in world affairs, how likely is it that countries like Brazil and South Africa may politically side with Russia and China uh, on issues like this in the future? At the moment it's not clear whether South Africa and Brazil or even India would take a stronger position on the whole question of Syria. But I think Russia in particular and to a great extent China, they have decided that um, they would draw the line as far as Syria is concerned. And from the point of view of international politics, of the politics of hegemony and uh, the politics of liberation if you like, it makes sense that um, these two countries have chosen to draw the line. Because we know that if you look at what's been happening in Syria, which is linked to the whole of uh, the Middle East, this is undoubtedly an attempt by Washington, Paris, London, and uh, some of their client states in uh, West Asia, in the Middle East, to set the pattern for a new Middle East that would serve US and Israeli interests in the long run. This is what uh, Condoleezza Rice meant when she talked about the new Middle East, what they're trying to do. And they have taken advantage of the Arab uh, uprisings in order to uh, advance their own agenda. Because you know when it first happened uh, in uh, Tunisia and uh, Egypt, they were caught unaware. But very quickly they decided to move in and to, in a sense, seize the moment. And this is what they're doing in Syria. In Syria too, you know, there was uh, some protest, but uh, right from the outset there was an armed dimension to the whole thing, which means that there were people smuggling in arms in order to topple the government of uh, Bashar Assad, which is uh, an authoritarian government, there's no doubt about it, but nonetheless it was an authoritarian government which was also trying to make some changes, but these changes have all been ignored, including the democratic constitution and you know, an attempt to hold municipal elections, parliamentary elections, everything has been ignored because the Western powers and their client states in the Middle East, they've got an agenda. And the agenda is regime change. And why this regime change? A number of different actors want regime change for different reasons. In the case of the Western powers, I think it is linked to both hegemony and Israel. 
hegemony because this is the most strategic region in the world, the Middle East. It is also a region that is very important in terms of uh, oil and it's because Israel is there. It's very important to Israel, even though Israel has been rather quiet on this whole question of Syria, but we know it's very important to Israel. Why? Because Israel occupies the Golan Heights and the Golan Heights supplies one third of Israel's water, which is not highlighted in uh, the mainstream media. You'll only get this from uh, certain analysts like, you know, uh, Michael and others who would write about this, but most of the time you find that people don't even talk about this, that one third of Israel's water actually comes from the Golan Heights. And Israel has done something else in the last few weeks which goes against international law. It is a blatant violation of international law. They're exploring the Golan Heights for oil and gas, which you're not supposed to do. You're an occupying power. So you see, Israel's stake in this whole crisis, the Syrian crisis, is very, very big. But it is camouflaged, just like, you know, they wanted the Iraq war. But, uh, you know, they were rather quiet about it. But they are one of the beneficiaries. And if you look at some of the other actors, uh, Nile, you know, you can see what the game is. And it's, I think, very, very serious as far as Syria goes. There is a strong anti-Shia dimension. And that, to my mind, has uh, repercussions for the entire region because it is something very emotional. This is being presented by the Saudi elite, the Qatari elite, and to some extent by the elite in Ankara, the Turkish elite, as a sort of fight against the Shias. Why? Because the Alawites in Damascus, they are a branch of uh, the Shia community. And uh, more important, of course, uh, the Syrian government is closely linked to Iran, and Iran is uh, Shia. So there is a Shia element that has uh, emerged. And don't forget that uh, as far as Israel is concerned, as far as the others are concerned, there's Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon, and uh, Hezbollah is also Shia. So you see, there is this attempt to present this as a fight against uh, the Shias, a fight against uh, Persian dominance vis-à-vis -vis the Arabs. You know, all sorts of you know, dimensions are beginning to emerge. And the emergence of uh, dimensions linked to religion and sectarianism and so on, it's going to muddy the crisis. But these people don't care. They are prepared to kill, they are prepared to manipulate uh, the situation to their advantage. Even really if you look at what happened at Hola. Now, there is no way that uh, the Hola massacre would have been engineered by the state. Why? Because it doesn't serve their purpose. You're weakening your case. You have to ask yourself who benefits. That's the first question one has to ask. And the ones who benefit from Hola are undoubtedly the ones who want to remove Bashar Assad. This is why they have uh, got into a frenzy over Hola. And if you look at the evidence that is emerging now, it's quite clear that um, there was active manipulation by the so-called armed opposition. So I look at Syria. I think it is important that Russia and China have drawn the line on Syria. And I hope others will also stand out. You know, there's tremendous pressure even on countries like uh, Malaysia to expel the Syrian uh, ambassador. And they're doing it in a number of other countries. So when you have people like McCain and uh, Lieberman coming here, you know, this is one of the things that they had asked for, which of course is not reported in the media, that uh, take a tougher stand on this issue, stand up, you know, to Bashar Assad, you know, it's just, you know, ridiculous what they're trying to achieve. So I hope more and more countries, and that I think is the burden of your question, you know, South Africa, Brazil, a number of other countries, I hope they will stand up on this issue because it is really fundamental. It is also fundamental from another perspective, you know, as a student of religion, I have always taken this position that uh, one should not have states that are based upon religion as such. And uh, whatever one may say about Bashar Assad, you know, he has, I think, been very consistent in standing up against religious ideologies of a certain kind. I mean, it's basically a secular government in Damascus. I see that as very important too, because if you look at what's happening in the Middle East now, you find that uh, 
Islamic elements have become very, very influential through the ballot box in many instances, partly because of the Arab uprisings. One can argue that this, in a sense, is understandable because many of these movements were suppressed in the past. It's understandable because people see Islam as uh, a ideology that will liberate them from oppression and uh, from uh, social injustices and all the rest of it. And uh, one can understand that. But one should also ask, what do they represent, these new Islamic forces? What does the Islamic uh, movement in uh, Egypt represent, for instance? What is their thinking about neoliberal capitalism? What is their thinking about US bases? What is their thinking about uh, Israel itself? You know, are these uh, questions, uh, have these questions been answered? These are very important issues. In fact, my fear is that the Iqbal Muslim and the Muslim Brotherhood is uh, beginning to gravitate more and more towards neoliberal capitalism, which means perpetuate the status quo. And that won't be in the interest of the people. The uh, BRICS nations have discussed the possibility of trading and issuing uh, loans in their local currencies. Uh, can the formation of a BRICS bank work to challenge institutions like the IMF and the World Bank? It may be a bit too early to challenge these institutions. And I think uh, the BRICS nations, they're adopting a two-track approach, meaning by which they are very much part of uh, the IMF, for instance, you know, and they are very concerned about uh, reforms in the IMF and the World Bank. But at the same time, they are strengthening uh, their own institutional mechanisms, and I think uh, that approach makes sense. I would argue, uh, Niall, that um, the critical question here actually is the role of uh, the US dollar as the world's uh, reserve currency. And this is why countries like China, in particular, they're saying, look, um, we have to deal with this. And the IMF is not going to deal with this. In fact, the IMF has helped to perpetuate the US dollar as the world's reserve currency in uh, many indirect ways. So what the Chinese are saying is, uh, we know what the situation is with the US dollar, and one of the reasons why we have this global financial crisis is because of the role of the US dollar. And they're right, they're absolutely right. So let's strengthen other currencies. And maybe eventually you will have what the Chinese have proposed a few years ago. You will have uh, maybe uh, a basket of currencies which would play the role of uh, global reserve currencies, which would become the main medium of exchange amongst uh, countries, trade and uh, investments and all the rest of it, perhaps we would be able to move in the direction. Now, what the BRICS have done at this stage, encouraging uh, trade using their own currencies, you know, they want to do that, I think that's a very positive step. And the Chinese, they've gone beyond talking about this, and it is very significant that a lot of trade from now onwards between China and Japan would be in the yen and the yuan. I think that's very, very important because Japan is the second biggest economy in the world. So if there is that sort of change and in East Asia, let's say the Koreans also come on board, it's going to make an impact. In fact, people are saying that um, as more and more countries put aside the US dollar for trade, and also as a reserve currency. If you look at the reserves of a number of countries, they've diversified their reserves. They don't want to keep their money just in the US dollar. I think these are very significant changes. Why now? Because if you look at um, US imperialism, I think there are three pillars on which US imperialism rests. One is, of course, its armed might, the military basis, its weaponry. Number two, it is actually the dollar and that will have to go. And number three, of course, it is uh, their soft power in the form of entertainment and Hollywood and, you know, all the books and, and the impact on our mind, you know, and that is going to be the most difficult. But I think these things will have to change. Uh, also, as well, uh, I'm just curious, were you, yeah. uh, how do you think the, the role of sanctions on Iran uh, you know, that's going to create a spike in oil prices due to the fact that a large percentage of the world's oil reserves are now out of the market. Uh, how is that going to affect the U.S. dollar, in your opinion? I think it will have an impact because if you look at what uh, India has chosen to do, 
you impose sanctions, you know, these are the sanctions related to Iran's central bank, which means that Iran is uh, hampered from uh, trading with uh, various countries. Now, what the Indians have said is we'll use rupees, and I think others are also saying we'll use our own currencies. That's going to affect uh, the US dollar. Mm -hmm. But um, at the moment, and you know, there are usually, I suppose, various forces that intervene when you initiate changes of this sort. But at this particular point in time, the Iranian people are paying a very big price, actually, because of those sanctions. And I don't know whether they will be able to withstand this in the short run. In the long run, there will be changes which will benefit them. But in the short run, it's going to be very tough. And this is why I have a feeling that Iran also wants some solution to this whole question. And they would want the talks to succeed. But they will not want to do it at the expense of their national dignity. Now, Europe, unlike the United States of America, and I think this is very interesting, one has to make a distinction of sorts. I think some of the European countries also want a solution because they know that if um, Iranian oil doesn't reach their shores, it's going to affect them quite badly, especially at a time when the economies are in the doldrums. And uh, you have, in addition to all the other problems you have, you know, your sovereign debt crisis and all the rest of it, you have this problem of uh, energy supply. They don't want that. So I'm feeling that some of them are interested in working out a solution. But in the case of the United States of America, the big problem is, of course, Israel and the Zionist uh, lobby. They don't want a solution to this because as far as they're concerned, this is the time to pulverize Iran if they can. This is what they want to do. I don't know whether it will come to that, but uh, even uh, the Zionist lobbies of the United States of America, they cannot ignore one other factor as far as Iran is concerned. When Iran says that it will exercise its rights over the Straits of Hormuz if there is a crisis, in other words, they will close the Straits of Hormuz, I think they know that Iran means what it says. They will close the Straits of Hormuz and never dramatic impact upon the global economy and they don't want that either. So it, it is a situation where I think everyone is um, very much aware of the huge risks that are involved and they want some solution but uh, unfortunately the least rational force in this entire equation is I think Israel and the Zionist uh, power base in the United States of America. A new Korean War would inevitably provoke interference from larger regional powers, uh, leading to a potentially disastrous security crisis in East Asia. Uh, now, what kind of policy, policy should the U.S. exercise towards the Korean Peninsula to avert further crisis there in the future? As far as the Korean crisis is concerned, my own reading is that China itself, and to a large extent Russia, they want um, a peaceful, amicable settlement of um, the Korean issue. Why? Because it's not in their interest for a war to break out at this point. And this is why I have a feeling that both China and Russia will lean heavily on uh, Pyongyang not to do irrational things. This, I think, is something which makes Pyongyang a bit uh, different, if I may say this, from uh, Damascus or Tehran. You know, Damascus and Tehran, at the end of the day, they're very rational about what they want. They're calculating their moves and all the rest of it. But Pyongyang, you know, it makes some really bizarre statements and sometimes does very bizarre things. You know, it is a much more closed regime. And this worries China and Russia. So it's not just the United States of America. I think China and Russia are also very concerned about Pyongyang and how it behaves. But at the same time, China knows, and so does Russia, that they cannot allow the United States of America to dictate terms as far as the Korean Peninsula is concerned. Why? Because they know that um, there are nuclear weapons in South Korea, which um, North Korea is very concerned about, and China is also very concerned about this. They also know that uh, the US, and this is a more important uh, factor, that the US is using the Korean issue against China. 
that it is a way of either drawing China into a conflict which it doesn't want or it is a way of curbing China's influence in uh, East Asia. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese are also playing their cards very carefully as far as this issue goes. And I have a feeling that countries in the rest of Asia, and especially Southeast Asian countries, uh, I'm sure you remember Malaysia played a role in the, the North Korea, South Korea talks a few years ago. They were hosted here in Kuala Lumpur. The countries in this region also would want to see an amicable resolution of uh, the Korean issue. They're hoping, for instance, that this uh, new leader of uh, Korea, he would be more sensible about the way in which he responds to situations, that the six power talks would uh, restart. And uh, as a result of these talks, there would be some arrangement vis-a-vis -vis nuclear weapons, uh, use of nuclear energy, the larger question of economic aid for North Korea. And uh, I really hope that uh, in South Korea, there will also be uh, the type of leadership that we had in the past, uh, someone like you know, Kim Dae-yong, who, as you know, launched the Sunshine policy, which made a lot of sense. He wanted to work towards the eventual integration of North and South Korea, which I think would be very important for not only East Asia, but for global politics as a whole. So if there is such a leadership in uh, South Korea that is more inclined towards a uh, nationalistic uh, solution, at the moment you don't have that sort of leadership. The present leadership in um, Seoul is perhaps one of the most pro-US leaderships that we have had in a long while. But if there is a different sort of leadership as a result of the democratic process, and in the North you also have someone who can understand the larger picture, then I think um, things would look better. Excellent. Thanks a lot for the uh, conversation today, Dr. Mozavar. Uh, very interesting views.